Uh, can I welcome to the stage, please, Mr. Paul Fenwick. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, do hold with me for just one moment while we have some lovely feedback. Oh, we're gone. Now some lovely lack of microphone. And, um, oh, am I there? Okay, cool. And I'm just going to get myself plugged in. How are we all this morning? Excellent. Excellent. Wonderful. Do we have technology working? We do. <laughs> so, um, who here has a brain? Most of you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is why my brain is working right now. Um, a big, big thank you to Kathy Reed for, uh, for bringing me brain working fuel. I hugely appreciate it. <clears throat> so um, I've actually been fascinated by brains for the last year. When I discovered that I actually had one and that people have been studying these things, it's not just some squishy thing in your head that zombies like to eat. It's actually something that people have been studying. And um, the more I looked at what people were doing with brains, the more fascinating I, I, I became. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is some of the things I've discovered about brains and minds, which is the software that runs on top of them, and um, also why they suck, because there are lots and lots of ways in which they suck. So let's go back quite a few years to 1978. And uh, in 1978, there was a perception experiment that was done. Now, you'll notice I have lots and lots of references throughout my slides. Um, on the wiki, I'm going to put up a complete list of references, so if you happen to be the sort who wants to go and look for papers, you can do so. So, in 1978, a perception experiment is done, and it's a very, very simple experiment. You have a person, they're sitting in front of a screen, and on the screen, there are two pictures. On the left, there is a snow scene, and on the right, there is a picture of a chicken, a picture of a chicken foot. In front of them are some cards, and they're asked to pick the two cards which correspond to the pictures they see in front of them. So far, very, very simple. What makes this experiment interesting, however, is that the subject in this experiment has a split brain. So what's happened is they've had their corpus callosum severed. That's the, the bridge which connects the left and right hemispheres of the brain. So that gets done sometimes surgically as a radical treatment for epilepsy. If you have epilepsy, you can contain it to one hemisphere. It's a sort of last-ditch surgery, but it's happened with this person. So they see the picture of the chicken foot, and of course they pick the chicken. And they see the picture of the snow scene, and they pick a snow shovel. So far, everything seems completely normal until you ask them why. And they say, well, I picked the chicken because it goes with the chicken foot, and I picked the shovel to clean out the chicken pen. <laughs> there is no mention of the fact that there is a snow scene. There is no mention of snow at all. So what the hell is going on here? <laughs> well, what's happening is the left hemisphere in the vast majority of people is the only hemisphere which develops language. It's the only hemisphere which does uh, grammar and words and speaking and reading and all those sorts of things. And so the left hemisphere, which sees the right visual field, understands why it picked the chicken, but it's got no idea why it picked the shovel, except that it knows that I picked a shovel. So it does what any self-respecting brain would do, and it simply makes it up. <laughs> what is fascinating is that you can see how it is made up. You can pop somebody into an fMRI machine, you can see which bits of their brain are lighting up. And when somebody makes something up about themselves, there's part of the left prefrontal cortex, sort of at the front here of the brain, which lights up. It gets very, very creative. Then the memory centers light up when the memory gets stored in there, and then they light up again as the memory gets retrieved. So what happens is it feels like a true memory. The person experiencing this is not aware that there was a snow scene and that's why they picked the snow shovel. They've just made something up, but they believe that to be true. So here we have a person who is not only unaware of why they made a particular choice of action, but they are profoundly unaware. They are unaware that they are unaware. Now, this is not something which is restricted to people with interesting brain configurations. This is something which happens to everyone, because we all experience consciousness, but for us to fully understand, 
what consciousness is, we would need a larger consciousness to be able to model that. So we're always going to be missing something. <laughs> so I decided I wanted to learn about brains. And in my research, I discovered that there are three professions which know more about brains than anybody else. One of them are psychologists. They effectively look at the mind, what's running on top of your brain, and they know an awful lot about behavior and how people work. One of them's a neuroscientist and neurologists. They're effectively looking at the hardware, how everything joins together, how everything talks to each other. But the profession that really knows their stuff really well, that do this sort of thing absolutely every day and make people like really, really are fully switched on, salespeople. <laughs> Salespeople are absolutely brilliant at brains because it's their job to hack your brain and get you to buy something you don't want. And if you're like me, they're very good at it. So, <clears throat> they know how our brains work and they know how to trick your brain. Now, one of the things which is fascinating here is that tricking your brain is not very hard. Tricking your brain is disgustingly simple. Because given the absence of like anything else controlling it, brains will trick themselves. And I'll give you a fascinating study to show you how. So back in 1996, uh, Barg, Chen and Burroughs got together and they did a study on priming. Now what do I mean by priming? Priming is essentially where you give somebody a, a language task or you give them a puzzle and it might be something like anagrams or jumbled word sentences. And you say, I'm trying to test your language ability. That's actually a complete lie but that's what you tell people. I am trying to test your language ability, and I want you to unjumble a sentence. So you might have something like this. There are five words, and I might ask you to form a sentence of four words which is grammatically correct. And you can look at that and say, okay, he finds it instantly. That would be a grammatically correct sentence. The important thing about these jumbled words is you have to think about them. Likewise with anagrams, you have to think about them. So it helps get that whatever's in there sort of seeping into your head. Now that's a neutral sentence. I'm not actually priming you in any way there. But if I added some priming words to it, then I might be able to influence you a little bit. <laughs> so there's the same puzzle, but you might be influenced by that. So these researchers were doing the same thing. They were taking these word puzzles and they were adding to some of them words which might influence people. So one study they did was rude priming. Now I don't mean like, you know, swear words here. What I mean by rude priming is you add words like brazen or intrude or bluntly. So these are words which make people think about, you know, interrupting conversations. And in fact, that's exactly what they got them to do. The next stage of the process was that the subject had to interrupt a conversation to get the next thing that they were supposed to be doing. And what you discover is that if you've primed people with rude words, they're very likely to interrupt conversations. But if you've primed people with polite words, they're not very likely to interrupt conversations at all. And of course, neutral, as we expect, would be in the middle. So these would actually have a significant impact on people's behavior just by getting them to do word puzzles. You can do the same thing with hostile priming, which would cause people to judge others negatively. But my favorite was elderly priming. Just give me one moment to drink some water here. <clears throat> elderly priming involved word puzzles which contained words such as old or gray. <laughs> Or Florida. <laughs> I kid you not, you can look up the reference, Florida is in the elderly priming list. <clears throat> and then what they did is they studied how long it took for the participants to walk to the elevator. So there was somebody sitting out in the hallway pretending to read like a newspaper and they had a stopwatch in their pocket and they were just timing how long it took each person to walk to the elevator. And the people with elderly priming were significantly more likely to take longer, they took significantly more time to walk to the elevator. It was only like a second, but it was still quite noticeable. Now, these studies are almost universally done on psych students. The reason for that is because you can offer them course credit to participate in these sorts of studies. 
And so this is where this thing becomes fascinating because the next thing that you ask these students after they've done all these word puzzles and they've walked to the elevator and everything else, you sort of bring them in the next day and you say, did the word puzzles influence you? And as a psych student, they should know better. <laughs> but what they universally say is, no, you were testing my language ability. Of course they didn't influence me. And then you point out that they walked slowly to the elevator. And you say, why did you walk slowly to the elevator? Now, the answer they should be giving at this point is, I don't know. Because if they didn't think that the word puzzles influenced them, then they don't know why they walked slowly to the elevator. But instead, they don't say that. What they come up with are excuses like, I was tired, or I was thinking about something, or my leg hurt. In fact, the excuses they come up with are pretty much exactly the same that you would get from an external observer. They have no idea why they walked slowly, but they made something up, it got stored in their memory, it got pulled out again as a true memory, and then it got presented. And you can see a massive correlation between what they come up with and what external observers will give you. So this is an example of automatic behavior. And it comes as a side effect of our brain's thinking or believing that thinking is for doing. If you can get somebody to think about something, they are more inclined to do that, whatever it happens to be. So is there a way that we can exploit this? Of course there is. <laughs> Remember those salespeople? They care about prices. Prices are really important to salespeople. And, and this I found absolutely fascinating. There was a study done, um, quite recently actually, um, that involved an auction. So you had psych students, uh, they were bidding on a number of items. They included like, you know, a box of chocolates and a couple of bottles of wine and a wireless keyboard and mouse. Now, I have no idea how much a wireless keyboard and mouse is worth. Uh, psych students also have no idea how much these are worth. But they're asked to write down how much they're willing to pay. And this is a real auction. Like, whoever wins these auctions, whatever they write down, whoever writes down the highest bid, they get to pay their hard-earned cash, or their hard-earned Oz study, as the case might be, <laughs> and they get to take away these fabulous prizes. But first, before they write down how much they're willing to pay, they are asked to write down the last two digits of their social security number next to where they're going to write their maximum bid. Now, those two last digits are essentially random, so they really shouldn't make any difference at all as to how much people are willing to pay. But the results do not match the rational decisions. The results are amazing. Let's, let's just take a look here, okay? So blue is keyboard and mouse combo, and red is just the mouse only. And if we look at this here, if your social security number is between 0 and 19, the last two digits, you'll pay about 15 bucks for the keyboard and mouse. But if it's here, between 80 and 99, you'll pay, what, $55. That's like a three-fold increase. So a three-fold increase just by getting somebody to think about an arbitrary number. This is what we call anchoring. And it's a side effect of how we think. As a rule, humans absolutely suck at determining value. When I have no idea how much that keyboard and mouse is worth, I really have no idea. I don't know how much that would be asked for. I don't know if it's worth $15. I don't know if it's worth $100. I might have that as a ballpark. It's going to be somewhere in there, but I really, really don't know. What we are good at is comparison. Once I've spotted one thing, I can then compare other things to it and say, this is a better deal or that is a worse deal. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening here. People are paying more for the keyboard and mouse than they are for just the mouse alone because they understand adding the keyboard adds value. So the wonderful thing is that once we know about comparisons, we can exploit them. Once we know that people like to do compares, we can exploit that to our advantage. So bread makers are the canonical example here. Bread makers, when they first came out, they were big, they were clunky. The very first ones marketed for $275, and they did not sell. And the reason was, there was only one bread maker on the market. Nobody had any idea how much a bread maker was worth. So they'd walk into the store, they'd see the bread maker, it's $275, is it worth $275? No, maybe, they won't make a decision, they'll go away. 
So the solution to this was that the single only bread maker company in existence decided to build a second bulkier and less attractive bread maker <laughs> and then place that in the same stores as their original model but sell it for 50% more. So this is a product which nobody is going to buy. It's a product which costs more and is less attractive. But the result of this is that people could do a comparison. And they say, well, I don't know anything about bread makers, but of the two which are in the store, I'd much prefer the better looking one which is cheaper. And suddenly, they started to make lots and lots of money. Absolutely fascinating. Now that's what we call a decoy choice. A decoy choice is something which you'll never, ever, ever pick, but which influences your decisions. To give you another example of a decoy choice, there was a particular economics magazine that was doing studies to see how much it could sell that magazine for. And in one study group, they had two options. You could get an internet-only subscription for $59, or you could get an internet and print subscription for $125. And what they discovered from that study group is that most people wanted the internet option. We seem to have lost a little bit of scale there, but it's about 65% of people who are picking the internet option. In a second study group, they introduced a decoy choice. So you could have the internet only for 59, the same internet and print for 129, or you could buy the print only version for 125. Now nobody, nobody picks the print only version. But what they've got now is something to compare to. They say, well, I don't know how much the print only and internet version is worth. Oh, wait, I do. They're worth $59 and $125. That makes that a stupendously good deal. <laughs> because I'm getting like $59 off the price of what I'd normally be paying. And so now you find it reverses. <laughs> Quite staggeringly so. Internet and print with decoy, you have almost 85% of people picking that option. So by adding a decoy choice, you can massively influence people's decisions. And this is something to really be aware of, because decoy choices come up all the time, but if you're not aware of them, you won't necessarily spot them. And then you won't realize that you're being influenced by that. So can you use this for other things? Can we use this in everyday life? Hell yes, we can. <laughs> this is one of my favorite things ever, because you can provide decoy choices with people. So anytime you want to be selected for something, let's say that you want to be selected for a job or a position uh, or a sports team or even for a date, what you want to do is find somebody else who is similar to you, but who is much less cool. <laughs> and you get yourself compared by them to them. And they might say, well, I don't know anything about Perl developers, but compared to this guy, Paul looks pretty good. <laughs> now, these are all examples of what's called cognitive bias. And if you go to Wikipedia and you look up the list of cognitive bias, biases, there are hundreds of them. But don't do it this afternoon. Don't do it this afternoon? Blackout. Oh, okay, don't do it this afternoon because of the blackout. <coughs> don't do it now, I'm giving a talk. <laughs> So, <clears throat> there are lots of cognitive biases out there, and some of the most dangerous ones actually come from a very fundamental belief, which sounds harmless. That fundamental belief that we have is that I am a good person. People generally like to feel this way. They like to believe that I am a good person. But what the result is, is that they get all these things wrong. And, and one of the things I see all the time is estimating the amount of time it takes to do something. So anyone here who's been like, you know, a conference presenter and estimated how long it's going to take to prepare your slides? <laughs> yeah, and then you find like it's three in the morning the day before you're speaking and you're still there preparing your slides. And you're like, what's, what's going on here? Well, there's a wonderful study, and, and there are lots of studies which show this, I'm just picking one, um, where students were asked how long it would take for them to complete a particular assignment. And they were asked 50% confidence, so what's the chances that you'll be 50% finished, like 50% chance that you'll be finished by here, 75% confidence and 99% confidence. So average case and worst case. Like if you are hitting this one here, that's supposed to be your 1% of the time, that's your worst case scenario. 
And what they discovered is that when you looked at how long the students took to complete this assignment, only 13% of them had finished by their estimated average case. So they weren't very good at estimating how long that would take them on average. What's more, only 45% had finished <laughs> by the worst case scenario. So what that means is that on average, reality is actually delivering slightly worse than the worst case scenario. <laughs> so if you ask somebody what their worst case scenario is, that's roughly how long it might take them. They'll probably take them a bit longer than that. <laughs> Assuming they don't have something which is correcting their, their thought processes. And this is called the planning fallacy. And I actually hit this all the time, particularly with conference talks. The planning fallacy causes us to believe that our own projects, ones that we are doing or that we are personally involved in, will take less time, will cost less money, and will provide greater benefits than those projects being worked on by our peers. What's fascinating here is that people who are uninvolved, but who are familiar with the team or people, are actually much, much better at predicting how long things will take. So if you want to know how long a person will take to do a project, don't ask them. Ask one of their peers how long will it take for them to do this project and you'll get a much more accurate answer. Now, the reason for this all seems to be tied up with the ego. It all seems to be tied up that we want to make ourselves look good. And in fact, we know that if you ask people how long they'll take to do something, and they think that they're answering something anonymously, they will give you very accurate answers. So as soon as you remove that actual sense of self, things become much, much more accurate. The way in which you do this, if you're curious, is you, you bring students or you bring participants into a room, you give them a sheet of paper, and you ask them to fill out that sheet of paper with how long it will take for them to do things. And you say, don't put your name on it, just put it into that box over there. And then they put it in the box, they leave the room, and you open up the box and you take out the single piece of paper which they put in there. <laughs> you write their name on it, yeah. <laughs> now the thing is that we won't just be deluded about time. It's also possible to be deluded about skill. And um, this is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's absolutely fascinating. The Dunning-Kruger effect says that uh, people who are unskilled are often ignorant of the fact that they are unskilled. <laughs> to give you an example of uh, one study done in 1999, students in the bottom 25% of a particular set of tests, which involved things like mathematics and grammar, rated themselves as performing above the 60% mark. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Pia. However, this is not restricted to students. Because much, much earlier, it was discovered that 94% of college professors rated themselves as above average <laughs> compared to their peers. Now, that's not the way in which statistics work, but everybody likes to think that they're better than their peers. There is a small caveat to this, though. People who are highly skilled usually will underrate their abilities because people who are highly skilled are aware of what they don't know and so they're like, oh, no, I don't know all these things, so I'm not that good. They will also make estimations that other people also find whatever their field is easy or that other people will have more knowledge than they actually do. And in fact, anyone here who's heard of the imposter effect? Yeah, this is effectively contributing to that. The imposter effect is where you feel that you're not really an expert on something, and you don't really, you're not really the person to come up on stage and talk about it, or to, to write a program, or to do something else. You feel like an imposter. It's effectively the other end, the Dunning-Kruger effect. But during all my time looking how brains worked, um, I found one area that was most fascinating, and that was memory. Now, now, first of all, the reason I found memory fascinating is it is awesome, and a lot of the studies which study memory are completely awesome. The only thing which confuses me is how on earth do they ever get them past the ethics committees? <laughs> and, and you'll see why, because the people who study memory are differently moral to the rest of us. <laughs> like, I just keep coming across these studies and go, oh my God, how could you do that to people? So, so study number one, and this is not the worst study, um, involved finding people. This was informed consent, so they actually told people what was going to happen. So they would find people, and they would show them horrific images and movies. 
Like, like these are really, like, you know, the TAC commercials, these are like, you know, order of magnitude worse than that, like really horrible stuff. And um, with half of the people, they just said, okay, you're going to watch these horrible movies for an hour, and then we'll send you away. And with the other half of the people, we're going to get you to play Tetris after you've watched the movies to see whether or not playing Tetris will reduce the incidence of flashbacks in the next week. <laughs> this is why these things are awesome. It's like, really? Like horror movies and Tetris? You're doing a study on this? And you got funded? <clears throat> What's even more fascinating here is that actually works. <laughs> Playing Tetris interferes with your long-term memory laydown. So if you have just learnt something or just experienced something and then you go and play Tetris, it will not end up in a high fidelity memory. It might end up in a low fidelity memory instead. So keep that in mind. If you want to forget something, play Tetris. <laughs> if you want to remember something, I don't know, go play Minecraft or something. <laughs> <clears throat> the other thing about memory is that we actually have two sorts of memories. <clears throat> and uh, one type of memory is remembering the things which have happened, what's happened in the past. We call that remembering. The other type of memory, which works surprisingly in much the same way, is remembering what's going to happen in the future. So there's my flying car from 1967. It's called imagination. And what we know is that both of these things effectively employ our existing brain architecture to let us visualize what has happened or what will happen. So I'll give you an example. You're all familiar with the song Happy Birthday. So if I ask you which note of Happy Birthday is the highest note in the song, you'll all start singing it in your head. <laughs> yeah, OK, OK. You're using like the audio machinery in your brain to figure out what the high note is. Likewise, penguins are pretty cool. And if I ask you, with a penguin, are its fins longer than its flippers, then what will happen is you'll start visualizing a penguin to try and figure out which is longer. And both of those are examples of reusing existing brain architecture. Now, as it happens, if I give you that penguin problem and you are already visually occupied, <laughs> then you will... Then you will... <laughs> if you are already visually occupied, you will find it very, very hard to complete the penguin problem. Likewise, if I give you the happy birthday problem and you're already audibly occupied, you're listening to music or you're trying to do some sort of audio task, you'll find it very, very hard to do that. And the reason is that our brains have this rule of reality first. Anything which is actually happening to us overrides anything that we are thinking of or imagining or remembering. And that's a really important survival skill, that reality comes first. So. We know this works with the audio systems. We know this works with the visual systems. What about our emotional architecture? So we think it works with the emotional architecture, but how do you make somebody emotionally occupied? So this is where things become really quite awful. The way in which you make somebody emotionally occupied is that you give them like a psychometric study, and you say, please fill in all of these questions. And then you take it back and you go, oh, 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 dear. And the person's like, what? I was like, well, you know, I've, I've got my PhD in psychology, and I know that you might have friends now, but based upon all these personality indicators I can see in your test, you're not going to have any friends in a couple of years, and you won't be able to hold down a steady job, and you are going to die cold and alone. <laughs> and what that does is that provokes an emotional response. Now, what it does specifically is it provokes this harm response. It's like, oh, I'm feeling really hurt. And that then sort of shuts everything down. The person just sort of closes off. And um, of course, how do you test to see if somebody is in an emotionally shut down state? Well, one thing we discovered a number of years ago is that the circuits for emotional pain share much the same pathways as those of physical pain. So you can tell if somebody's emotionally shut down by poking them with sharp objects <laughs> and then measuring their response. But, but that's not very scientific. 
And so there is an instrument called a pressure algometer, <laughs> which has been invented in order to deliver precise and repeatable amounts of pain. <laughs> now, you can just imagine what sort of psychologists are doing these studies. <laughs> It is no surprise that the studies showed that when somebody is emotionally shut down, they cannot predict their future emotions, as expected. <clears throat> However, what's interesting is that even though that's the case, people don't necessarily realise that. People understand when they can't sing the happy birthday song. People understand when they can't easily visualise a penguin. But people don't necessarily understand when they're in a reality-first emotional state and that makes it hard to imagine what something is going to be like in the future. People who are full often find it's difficult to imagine being hungry, or vice versa. People who are depressed often find it difficult to imagine being happy. So if you're feeling sad and it's like you get invited to a party, you might go, oh no, no, I'm not going to enjoy that party, you know, it won't be very much fun. You might have a great time there, but you can't actually imagine that because your emotional machinery is already engaged. People who are Star Wars fans cannot imagine that they might regret that tattoo. <laughs> yeah, it just keeps getting better. <laughs> and this brings us down to a fairly fascinating point, which is very often we are unaware of our own emotions. We are unaware of what we are feeling, we are unaware of why we are feeling that way. We are unaware of what we are going to feel. And the next study involves looking at bridges. Now, there is a particular um, nature park up in, in Canada. It has two bridges over this river. That's an actual picture of one of them. It's this huge, enormous bridge. It sways. It's quite scary to walk across. The other one, this is a, an artist's rendition of what the bridge looks like. Um, the other one is a very safe bridge. It's very, very close to the ground, it's nice and wide, it's very, very stable. So there's a scary bridge and there's a safe bridge. And what uh, a bunch of, of scientists did is they surveyed people while they were crossing the bridge. So the person gets halfway across the bridge and a psychologist jumps out. <laughs> It says, hi, I'm a researcher from the University of so-and-so. Would you mind answering a few questions? And you get them to fill in this survey while they're in the middle of the bridge. And it's the same researcher every time. So you don't have, like, you know, different researchers being involved. And at the very, very end of that, they take back the, the questionnaire and they say, thank you so much. Um, look, if you have any questions um, or if you want a copy of my research or anything like that, then they scribble down in the corner, this is my name, this is my phone number, and they tear it off and they say, you can give me a call if you want to get in touch. And um, they write down a different name for the scary bridge as they do for the unscary bridge. So they can tell if somebody calls up and they ask for this person which bridge they're on. So what the study was actually looking at is not so much what people were answering in those questionnaires, but how many people called afterwards. And of those people who called afterwards, specifically, how many of those asked the researcher on something which could be construed as a date? And what they discovered, scary bridges, <laughs> more dates. And you might be thinking, what the hell is going on here? It's the same researcher every time. Do they suddenly become more attractive when they're on a scary bridge? Yes. And yeah, the, the answer is yes, they do. They absolutely do. And to understand this, we need to understand the two-factor theory of emotion, which goes a little bit like this. Let's pretend that you are on a roller coaster. Roller coasters are scary, but you know cognitively that the roller coaster is not scary. The roller coaster is safe, at least most of them are. <laughs> but despite that, you experience elevated heart rate, you have pupil dilation, you have light perspiration. These are all physiological signs that you are scared. But roller coasters are safe, so therefore that must not be the reason why you're feeling that way. And so you look for cues as to why you might be feeling this way. Now, if you happen to be on the roller coaster with another person, 
that, oh, the reason I'm feeling this way is because I'm attracted to them. Now, you actually see this all the time in movies. You'll have somebody who gets rescued, and then they go, oh, I'm rescued, and they'll like kiss the person who's rescued them, even though that's not a good reason to start a relationship. <laughs> but it happens all the time in movies. So, are there exploits for this? Well, there's a rather obvious one you could probably figure out, which involves roller coasters. Um, <laughs> but what I want to talk about is exploits in general and uh, how you can use them to your advantage of all the stuff that we've seen. One thing which you can use is situational effects. Because we have this whole idea of thinking means doing, if we can put ourselves in a situation where we're thinking about something more or are more acclimatised to doing something, that can help us do that. So I've discovered that when I'm in the office, I'm better at working. I've discovered that when I'm in a cafe, I'm better at thinking. I'll go to a cafe, I'll pull out my notepad, or I'll pull out my laptop, I'll be really, really good at thinking. When I'm at home, I like to think that I'm better at writing talks, but usually I'm better at playing Minecraft. <laughs> the other thing is, be really aware of decoys. Any time you have a reaction of, oh my goodness, who would possibly pick that? It's probably a decoy, and it's probably trying to push you into something. Likewise, if you've ever had a traumatic experience and you don't want to remember it, just try playing some Tetris. It tends to work great. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.